Greetings of the day, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Saurabh Pratap Singh. I am a first year student of Masters in International Development at Kennedy School, Harvard University, and I'm the panel manager of this uh, discussion. I want to start with giving a very broad idea about this panel we had. And I read somewhere that expected life of democracy in a country with per capita income under 1,000 USD is about eight years only, and between 1,001 to 2,000, the life is expected to be enduring about 18 years. Just look at us. We started with below 100 per capita at the time of independence, and I think very recently we have just managed to go over 2,000 uh, USD dollar, and still. The, I mean, it's not less than a miracle that a country of 36 states of and union territories, a country with 1.36 billion people and 121 languages, has embraced and nurtured democracy for the last seven to eight decades, despite several socio-economic and political challenges. And today, we are proudly world's largest and most vibrant democracy. Despite our Miraculous democratic journey. We have not been able to grow as fast as our contemporaries like China or South Korea have grown. And there is a largely divided academia over the issue if democracy is actually a necessary and sufficient condition for development. And main reason for this discussion is that despite the fact democracy intends to ensure an inclusive development, the process of consensus building in democracy for decision making is actually very cumbersome and difficult. So how can we resolve this to grow faster, while not compromising on the key issue of inclusiveness? Today, we are taking this question to the most important pillar of democracy: the opposition. I and many of young Indians like me would like to know how the opposition can play a constructive role in inclusive development of India. And to discuss this pertinent issue, I am privileged to introduce you to our distinguished panelist. Sri Raghu Karnad, who is also the moderator of this discussion, uh, Sri Karnad is a journalist and writer and a recipient of Yale's Wyndham Campbell Prize in 2019 and many other prestigious awards. He is also the former chief of, chief of bureau at the Wire.in, a news website he helped to launch in 2015. We have Sri Muthi Supriya Sule. Uh, Sri Muthi Sule is a senior Indian politician from the Nationalist Congress Party, a three-time member of Parliament. She has represented the Baramati constituency in 15th, 16th, and 17th Lok Sabha. She has also represented Maharashtra in the Rajya Sabha. We have Sri Gaurav Gogoi. Sri Gogoi is a second-term member of Parliament, and he represents Kalia Bor from the state of Assam. He currently serves as the deputy leader in the Lok Sabha from Indian National Congress. And we are also have we also have Raghav Chadha, a leader and national spokesperson of Aam Aadmi Party. Who also also serves um, the sitting MLA from Rajinder Nagar, Delhi, and was appointed as the vice chairman of Delhi Jal Board in 2020. I extend our hearty welcome to all the panelists on behalf of entire India Conference team and on behalf of all our viewers worldwide. Just a quick reminder to our viewers: you can ask your questions using Q and A tab, which is available down your screen. But please, while asking question, be precise and contextual. If someone has already asked a related question, you can just upload that question rather than asking the same. And please do not forget to share your experience on social media platform using hashtag ICS 2021. Thank you once again, everyone. And I hand it over to distinguished moderator Shri Karnad. Over to you, Raghu. You were on mute, Raghu. Thank you. Thank you for that. Had to start on a on a note like that. But um, good morning, so uh, Supriyaji, Raghav, and Gorov, and good evening to everyone in Harvard or in the United States. And bravo to anyone who's joining us from a time zone in between. Uh, this really is an extraordinary panel. I'm very genuinely excited to to host this conversation because it's such a critical moment for India's democratic opposition for democratic protest in just a sense that there are. Democratic alternatives um, that um, that are going to stay with us in the future. So, no no better time to understand the opposition better and what role uh, these key figures believe they should be playing. And I also want to note that while all of you, all three of you, are figures in the opposition at the national level, two of you are also key members of parties uh, that are governing states. Um, in this case, Maharashtra and, and Delhi, 
and Gaurav, your party had, of course, been well established in power in Assam and has only been out of power for one term. And the election is around the corner. So clearly, you all three, both, uh, you all see both sides of the coin and you know it well. But before we launch into such a massive uh, political, ma sort of uh, essential political question, I wanted to start on a slightly personal note. And I want to draw you out to share any personal experience or a personal moment that you've had that highlighted for you how essential it was uh, to have a political op opposition that can steer the government towards inclusive development. And obviously, this could be a moment, uh, a sort of a revelation that you had before your political career, because all three of you had, um, had uh, lives before prior to your first, uh, the first elections you contested. Or it could be um, something that you've had in, as, in your recent role as an opposition leader. Supriyaji, would you like to start? Also on mute. Akshay had given me so many strict instructions of staying mute. <laughs> so I'm almost petrified. I'm trying to follow every rule. Anyway, good morning. It's a pleasure to be on this, especially uh, Gaurav, who also happens to be my benchmate uh, in parliament. And since Gaurav has joined parliament, we have been in opposition. So I think we, it's a great topic for Gaurav and me because we have been on this side for the last six years together. So we've dealt with a lot of issues together about this. Well, personally for me, whether you are in power or you're in opposition, I think any healthy democracy needs a op opponent or an opposition just for checks and mates. Like even if we were in power, I think it was nice to have an opponent to make sure that the larger interest of the nation is protected. So I won't say that, oh, we need to do a great job now because we are in opposition and if we are in power, I think everybody, nobody should say anything. The things do go wrong. It's, it's human, it's normal. Sometimes the intent is there, but we do make mistakes. Like I'll tell you, I felt a lot of times when we were in power before uh, MVA came in or in the center, some education issues would always trouble me because I felt there were kids who were still out of school and we were not giving them the best education. So I was always boring with the government is why are we not doing this? Why are we not doing that? And I think so for me, being in opposition or having an opposition is it's a must. And now how strongly we fight it is another story. But this is the past. Now, if you bring me in the moment as today, I felt uh, for me, the biggest moment was when, you know, we were talking about vaccinations and I felt in the last uh, session, the present government did everything to avoid any discussions on vaccinations in India. As a matter of fact, during question hour, the question even came, but they jumped it and clubbed it and did really strange things. And I was really upset and I spoke to the Honorable Speaker about it as well. Because I remember Nirmala Sita Ramanji, when she went to Bihar, she had specifically made an election promise that we will give every poor person free vaccination. I mean, the state where I come from, the numbers are really rising. My point is, if there is surplus uh, injections available, doses available, why aren't we giving them? I mean, what are we as an opposition doing? It's not about, oh, what is government of Maharashtra doing? You know, how come numbers are increasing there? Hello, this is a pandemic. If there is a solution, why aren't we aggressively using it? So as an opponent or as, an, as a member of opposition, even if I was in power, I would raise this issue. It's, it doesn't mean that you have to succumb to everything that you're part of an organization to say. We're not yes people. I think in a healthy democracy, we must voice what is in the larger interest of the nation first, for sure. I mean, that's right. my belief. Thank you. So that's an Example, sorry. So that's an example of uh, the role of the opposition in spurring the government to act more effectively and uh, and and more swiftly. Um, Gaurav, I uh, I don't know whether you whether do you have a, st a story or an experience that you'd like to share off the bat, or whether I should uh, bring Raghav in next. You might also be muted. Raghav, do you want to, to jump in and tell us about uh, your something that comes to mind as a moment, a, a highlight, a highlighted moment? Um, 
that made you realize the, how essential the opposition would be? So, uh, you know, Raghu, since you talk about joining politics and the role of opposition, I quite frankly uh, didn't choose politics. I think politics chose us. And we are, uh, you know, ordinary folks coming from middle class households where professionals and we were part of a huge movement, uh, the Jan Lokpal Andolan, where, you know, several hundreds, thousands across the country were protesting against the then government and demanding uh, an anti graft legislation. And uh, I think it was uh, the Jan Lokpal movement that was a defining moment in lives of several of us. And it was uh, at the peak of the movement when we were given to understand by the then, uh, you know, political executive in the government that if you really want these legislations, if you really wish to bring about a change, why don't you guys come and jump into politics? And they simply refused to cater to the demands of, uh, you know, those who were agitating. And we were challenged and we were repeatedly challenged and we were repeatedly told that why don't you guys <clears throat> try a, a hand or two at politics? try forming your own party, try contesting the elections, try uh, put fielding candidates, try campaigning, and then try winning an election. And if you do uh, succeed, eh, then you can enact your own legislation. And I think we took that jibe as a challenge. And as a result, we formed our own party. We uh, fielded our candidates. We fought the election. We won the election. We formed the government and then enacted the legislation in Delhi. So I think that, quite frankly, uh, was uh, a moment when I thought uh, that, you know, it's important to stand up to the forces, it's important to the powers that be. And also, uh, you know, uh, we, 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 we come from a society and all of us come from a society where politics, unfortunately, is considered to be, you know, an arena of those who are either unemployed or unemployable. It is considered to be a dirty arena. It's considered to be, you know, uh, a game of thugs. Uh, and those who are, uh, you know, uh, flushed with uh, money power, muscle power and media power, not to say that everyone who is in the arena of politics uh, has, uh, you know, is unemployed or unemployable, but that's the perception that many in the society have. And to give up one's lucrative career and join politics was, cons was, was not an ordinary thing, I think. And uh, uh, it is only because I think we were challenged, we were in a position, the circumstances were such that several of us, including our leader, Mr. Arvind Kejriwal, who uh, was, has served the Indian Revenue Service, was an income tax commissioner, uh, you know, uh, was also uh, an IIT engineer who left an extremely, extremely lucrative career to get into public service. So I think uh, it is only when we were challenged and we were repeatedly denied an anti-graft legislation that all of us got together and thought that now it's time to do something concrete to, to play a role in Indian politics. That's right. A very memorable moment within our lifetimes of a popular movement actually turning into a party in the opposition uh, to in order to channel that energy. So I hope you'll be able to talk about that more. Gaurabji, I, uh, I'd love to hear a, a, a story from you so, so that we can launch into, um, into the bigger questions. One of, if, one prompt I might give you is that you gave a very powerful speech in Parliament uh, two years ago when, no, sorry, a, a year, slightly more than a year ago when the CAA was introduced. And I'm sure that must have been a memorable speech for you. Maybe that's one moment you would like to talk about in terms of, uh, of, of thinking about the power and the necessity of the op and Well, um, thanks, Raghu. Good morning and uh, good evening to everyone. Well, I was thinking about another story. So let me tell you that story first, which is that um, maybe close, more than a decade ago, uh, where I was, uh, uh, you know, a public policy student, like many of the participants uh, at this conference, and I was uh, in the US uh, doing my master's. Um, I actually spent an entire summer um, in the West Bank um, in Palestine, and I went to the Palestinian authorities, and I spent the entire summer there uh, working with uh, Palestinian civil society activists against um, the settlements um, that were there in the West Bank, um, especially, uh, you know, those which were surrounded and protected by the Israeli army. And I saw a lot of conflict firsthand as, as you know, between the military and the um, uh, people of uh, the Palestinian authorities. And, uh, you know, I spent an entire summer 
you know, with farmers who are trying to protect the lands from being gradually encroached upon by settlements, uh, did take some part, you know, did take uh, did take part in some protests, which you know can now be considered anti-national or can be now you know put me under a case of sedition here in India. As uh, but uh, I think that was a very powerful movement and moment for me uh, to see how people, if they need to be uh, protected from the excesses uh, of a government, need someone to represent them, and. In fact, I think that's what democracy is about. Democracy is not about making the life of government easier or it's not about making opposition more prominent. In the end, democracy is about people and it needs to work for people. And, and, and the best way democracy works for people is when there's accountability, is when there's transparency, is when there is, um, you know, is, is when there is a sense of um, uh, responsibility beholden to the people instead of the, instead of the government thinking that uh, they know it all and the people don't um, and bring coming to your question uh, which is about the citizenship amendment act and you've seen people more than opposition people are taking part in protests these days uh, and the citizenship amendment act saw widespread protests across India across the cross section of society both young and old women uh, and elderly and there were famous protest sites in Delhi. Of course, in Assam, there was a separate connotation. And there you feel that, you know, while there are these public protests, which are so evident and so visible, and still the government doesn't take a step back. So I think that kind of inflamed me even more um, to see, you know, because I felt the frustration of the people of Assam, especially when it came to the Citizenship Amendment Act. And I think that got expressed uh, in my speech. Uh, because I just couldn't understand when you have lakhs and lakhs of people protesting on the streets. Obviously, it's not a political stunt. It is something that affects people at their very core, at a very emotional level. Then I think that it's the role of the opposition to amplify that voice and put pressure on the government to think, to reflect, and maybe even take a step back. And, you know, and, and that's where we are today, even uh, when it comes to the farmers protesting. Uh, India, but I think we'll take that in a separate question later. But uh, those are two my two ex yes. experiences. Uh, my my summer in the West Bank um, and the Citizenship Amendment Act uh, protest, which just rocked my state. Thank you. That's fantastic. Thank you for uh, for giving us an international perspective. I like that very much, and and um, it's always worth not limiting your frame of reference just to uh, just to one country, just to our country. But these three anecdotes, I think, were, are, were, did exactly what I was hoping because we see three different aspects of both what the op where the opposition, you know, how the opposition acts and um, how and the difficulty of its role. So in Supriyaji's story, we see parliamentary proceedings being thwarted and sort of undermined. In Raghav's story, we see uh, a popular movement and a popular demand not being uh, not getting a response from. From the from the government or the opposition, and therefore requiring this 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 new party to form. And uh, Gaurabji, your first story actually tells us a more severe case, shows us more severe case of how of where an opposition is necessary to actually check the potential for violence um, and and for and for more kind of severe uh, measures that a government might take against people and where they need protection. So I think that's excellent, and it and it'll lead me into my next question now. A lot of the people who will be listening in won't actually be familiar with the particular roles that opposition party uh, plays. Now we know what a you know the elected party forms the cabinet and and um, and the executive. So what does the opposition do? I have a sense of three broad broad roles the opposition plays. It has a cooperative role in in participating in policy making, for instance, through parliamentary committees and putting up uh, and putting up bill members bills. It has a challenging role. That's the second one. A challenging role in in um, in sparking debate and in questioning in assemblies or in the media, uh, as as in the case that uh, Supriya just just talked about, pushing you know questioning and goading the government over the over the vaccine delivery. And then it has a third one. It has a defiant or a kind of adversarial role, which is su supporting public protest when. Um, when something genuinely unjust is happening or when that is necessary. Uh, I'm, 
we've seen actually it's uh, it's nice how your your three stories reflected all of those roles do you feel that um have i missed anything do you does any one of those seem most important or most appropriate for the opposition to do and in your experience is this are these roles becoming more difficult for the opposition to perform these are duties under the current government supriya ji why don't you uh, tell us no. first to add one uh, point to you that yes we are opponents but that doesn't mean we all our job is to just um, shout and scream against the failures of the government we all represent constituencies and and rightly so i think the accountability and transparency is becoming a lot more i'll give you a small example is like um, i mean i think we all feel so happy that somebody even bothers to ask us about our attendances parliament you might think it's a very small thing but when they rate us it's wonderful because please do understand we all leave our homes families work you know between all of this parliament takes a lot of our time and we are happy about it and that's all yes. i think we are elected so when you sort of make it accountable that you know you attended so many days and you didn't attend so many whatever it is i think that being highlighted is very very important for somebody like me and it's not just about you know making some noises against the government it's even making sure our constituencies get equal rights to all development barriers including all our social sector bar numbers should at always be at a good high you know all our public distribution service be it food be it medication everything has to be on par with the you know the top performing constituencies of the country so i think an opponent's role is not just about what you say in parliament or what you do it's any elected member see you are in the opposition or in administration but at the same time you are an elected member so there are basic 1 to 10 roles of what you do there as well so i think right. that is a And big since you brought it up, yeah since you raised it uh, supriya ji what is your parliamentary attendance no i don't want to tell you i feel i, mean, little... I know it's something like 100% isn't it <laughs> it's not 100% it's Fine, close I'll... it's close This is I know that I know that it's it's something that you are. I think Gaurav is also there. This is, Gaurav is not too far. We are on par. He's only away right now because of parliament. I mean, because of the election in the state. Otherwise, Gaurav and me are always there. Yeah. Well, I I I think it's very interesting to think about the distance between a constituency and work and and parliament and how you know and um, how representatives have to divide their time. um uh, raghav when you run for south delhi again you won't have that problem but i suppose um uh, uh most other parliamentarians do uh raghav gorav would you like to jump in and 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 just share your views on on the different kinds of roles from the cooperative to the adversarial that the political opposition um needs to play and whether those are becoming more difficult in recent years is it harder to carry out your duties as the opposition member who would you like to ask this question first why don't raghu? you go ahead sorry raghu okay please so yeah. uh, you know raghu i of course all of us on this panel i think every right thinking individual believes that a vibrant opposition is uh, the life blood uh, to any parliamentary democracy though the space of opposition in this country has been shrinking we see that today's opposition is fragmented is perhaps even fragile and in disarray but the role of opposition uh, i think is extremely significant for a for a functioning democracy to work for the people and i think uh, it is uh, as has already been outlined to hold the government of the day accountable uh, to bring in more transparency and also to safeguard the interests of those who have not been included in the policy making uh, and i think the role of opposition quite frankly is not uh, you know uh, merely limited to political parties what we see in india today is that farmers across the country are uh, perhaps giving uh, you know uh, uh, you know have 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 become the most credible opposition to the establishment where you see that uh, the kisan jathe bandiyas coming together several organizations not just one outfit and they have several differences among themselves also but they're keeping aside those differences for a bigger cause they're very disciplined and in a, in, a, in an extremely non violent way 
trying uh, to you know uh, put a demand forward before this government uh, or whether you take the example of several students who are uh, protesting across universities so i think the the with the shrinking and the fragmentation of the political opposition what you now see in india is that that space seems to be now being occupied by uh, non political actors like farmers like students etc however at the same time i think as far as the political opposition in a parliamentary democracy is concerned mm-hmm. it is extremely important and significant uh, you know for a uh, for a for a new uh, uh, articulation to come forward uh, which may come from existing political parties which may come from a regional political party which may come uh, from a from a, fo- a new formation of india's political opposition but a new articulation in terms of an alternative dream and al- al- alternative vision is also extremely required Uh, rather than just you know quibbling over day to day policy and uh, and and executive decisions of the government and i think that is where uh, you know uh, uh, it 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 would be it would be um, it i think it is incumbent on all of us to you know put forward that alternative vision that alternative dream uh, in order to become and serve as a, a real constructive uh, opposition that's a very powerful point thank you yes i i missed that in my list which is that there's a overarching uh, overarching role in in providing new ideas and a new vision for what we're all meant to be doing together um gaurav ji uh, over to you i think that uh, now you have an election coming up around the corner and um, and your state is uh, was the you know when this when the protests against the caa swept the country it was in assam that it that that's the that's the epicenter of of this issue I and mean, it's assam that has been the, the the testing ground for the nrc and uh and maybe the place where the ca is uh uh has the most social reverberations um as an opposition member do you, how how far into an adversarial role do you feel it's your responsibility uh thanks to go well i think it's not about uh, being an adversary or it's being uh, or, or or constructive i won't frame it like that but essentially political parties represent a particular economic idea a particular social value and a particular political philosophy and i think the one of the roles that political parties play whether you are in power or you are in opposition is that of creating awareness amongst people and i think that's uh, that's a, a major role of opposition polit- of opposition parties as well uh, is the role of public awareness and taking take the example what you've taken which is for the nrc or the caa now the government will try to spin its own um, meaning in terms of why the caa is beneficial or why the nrc is beneficial and they and they will reach out to public and try to create public opinion in favor of that and at the same time the opposition has to do the same you know we have to reach out to people to explain uh, how the caa is an attack on the indian constitution how the nrc has been an unjust and the results are are, are threatening and and the path uh, that this government is taking in terms of its political philosophy uh, will lead to the undermining of the, of human rights of many people of many communities so the role of public awareness the role of creating public opinion is extremely important again to take an international example is is this the, is the role of brexit in the uk where you had one pol- political section explaining the benefits and you had another section which was explaining the demerits and in the end it resulted in a referendum uh, which uh, voted in favor and i think the public outreach and the public awareness of those uh, supporting it was just stronger uh, but in this case i must say just to add another point it it is becoming a very far, increasingly difficult for opposition to reach out to the public because the role of the executive uh, has expanded the outreach of the government the powers of of governments have expanded governments are not just using laws but more and more they are using the industry they are controlling the media um in the us they are packing the courts with their own appointees um and they're using the police to stifle protest and arrest opposition leaders so the arms of the of governments of the executive have you know have gone beyond uh, their domain and they're reaching out to the cross sections of society the powerful and the influential sections of society 
to either stifle protests, to either make laws which make you know public gathering at protests difficult, or which just simply putting away uh, opposition leaders in jail, which I've seen in Assam as well, with a very um, powerful civil society leader being uh, arrested under cases related to national security and national investigation act. You've you've seen journalists now. Um, getting arrested for simply writing stories on reporting on events in many states. And I think this is an executive breach of power that is happening. And that's why the role of, uh, of what we consider, I would say the role of opposition has increased, as well as our perspective of what is opposition also has to be broader. Political parties are just a mere uh, entity within what we call opposition, but civil society, uh, educationists, uh, social media. So uh, these are other elements and other forms of opposition. And I think there needs to be a broader coalition uh, amongst actors in the opposition because governments these days are becoming so powerful um, and, and, and therefore simply a political party can't have the entire burden of the opposing a, a government of India. Uh, we need, from, you know, from um, breaching its executive uh, privileges, we need a large array of actors in opposition to hold the coalition uh, of actors in power um, to, to account and to check. So I think you know, we have to think much more broader uh, in terms of what we consider as opposition in today's India and today's world as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll make, in fact, I'll make the question after this about uh, one about that potential for that coalition and for the opposition acting more uh, with more concert. But, First, let me let, let, let me build on what you just said. Now, returning to the to the farmers' laws that were recently passed, it's um, it's it's significant, I think, that uh, the way in which they were passed in the Rajya Sabha uh, overrode many many of the many of the members of the Rajya Sabha protested that they overrode the the usual pro the process that uh, it was it was passed through with a voice vote, and in general, that the entire law, like most of the of the landmark laws that the, that the government has uh, has passed were steamrolled through parliament without being discussed in parliamentary committees, without being put through the whole consultative process that parliament has developed in order to make law lawmaking more democratic. That's something we've seen uh, that seems to only be on the rise. And similarly, as you pointed out, Gauruji, uh, the, the, the public, the, the you know the the arena of public democracy in which protest is 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 a is a citizen's right and an, an ability to speak to power is is shrinking um, maybe it's shrinking or, or or maybe not I think that we certainly see a great deal of protest but we also see some very severe and and increasingly uh, frightening repercussions to protesters and I mean the fact that we that we now have a 21 year old uh, climate change activist you know in jail for for working on a on a Google document, which has been turned into some kind of uh, in some some kind of conspiracy bogey, is is a good example. Uh, you you can't do better than that. Even though every month seems to bring a better example uh, uh, onto our you know onto our radar. So um, this is so the, the so it's it does seem to me that the, the central government's functioning is becoming more unilateral and many people say autocratic at the same time the uh, the the ceo of niti ayog created a memorable phrase a few a few weeks ago it might be the phrase of the the you know the defining phrase of 2021 when he said that important reforms are difficult in india because we are too much of a democracy it's not a good sound bite but uh, viewed as a political science question, I think you know it. It was not as objectionable a statement as it it was made out to be. There are trade-offs to democracy, and there are trade-offs to high dem levels of democratic mobilization. So, um, I think everybody feels and everybody realizes that we are in that that, that India is in a position where um, the where the central government is heading in a more autocratic direction, and the and the opposition or civil society is heading in a more defiant direction, uh, quote unquote, too much of a democracy. What, uh, under the current circumstances, what do you feel is your role? Should we be moving towards more consensus building? Do you feel we, you just need, or do you think we need to, that you need to be 
digging in and protecting the rights that are still available uh, to opposition members and to and to the public. Uh, let me take it backwards. Gaurav, uh, can uh, can you would you answer that question? Sure, um, Raghu. As I said at the beginning, democracy is about uh, the public, and you have to. And in the end, democracy creates a public good. Um, whether it's um, through an executive action or whether it's through the opposition putting pressure on the government. Let me give you a, a case in point, um, you know, the history of Assam in, in which the issue of immigration and undocumented immigration was a huge issue. And my party was uh, in power both in the state and at the center. And there were huge public protests um, in the late 70s and 80s against, uh, against my government. Um, both at the st state and the central level. But instead of branding protesters as anti-national or locking them up in jail, or what we did was in the end have a dialogue with them. And in that dialogue in which the prime minister, the then prime minister Rajiv Gandhi was himself involved in, we created an accord uh, which brought all the voices on the table. And that accord was through, called the Assam Accord of 1985, which you know, led to a consensus on what we define as undocumented uh, immigrants. And therefore, you know, and that led uh, to an era of peace and stability and Assam was brought back on the, you know, on, on the normal road to development and economic reforms. So in the end, I think you know, you know, opposition is important, but it's also in, it's necessary for governments to listen. I mean, it's not about an ego. It's not. It's, it's not about. Nobody loses. A government doesn't lose its dignity by taking a step back and being a, being approachable and being willing to listen. I think it only benefits people uh, when governments listen um, and try to work out a consensus. But in the end, I must say, the the responsibility of bringing consensus is more on the government because they, at the end, are are the more powerful. Um, stakeholder, they are the most powerful stakeholder in that idea. So for, you know, taking another example of the land acquisition law, you know, after many, many, you know, months of protest, the government of India decided that land acquisition law that they brought in uh, is not viable. And then they left it to the states to define their own version. And I think, you know, that created more space, that created more policy space, that created more flexibility for every state to define its own vision and its own roadmap. So I think in the end, you know, uh, the checks and balances work uh, and the governments need not be so stuck and so rigid. And it's not about losing public face of any one leader. And I think, you know, in the end, you know, stakeholders have to be brought um, to the table to negotiate, uh, to thrash out a consensus, a win-win formula. But the intention must be um, again, to bring about consensus, because consensus is how you've kept India together, united, despite its diversity. Consensus is what has worked in building this democracy, the largest democracy, into the most vibrant democracy. A democracy cannot be vibrant if there's no consensus, if people don't have a voice, if people don't feel, if feel that for five years they just have to sit quiet and take whatever dictates the government gives. That's not vibrancy. We have seen many examples of countries across the world where there's only one major political party and but there's only one, you know, and there's one powerful entity uh, in the government and it's completely unchecked. There are examples in Asia and then examples uh, in, the, in, in Central Europe as well. And nobody calls them a vibrant democracy. We are a vibrant democracy because we give space to each and every one of our citizens. We make their concerns valued irrespective of where they are, they might be from a tiny state in the Northeast, uh, but you know, they are valued and, uh, and they are given protection within the constitution of India as well. So there are several clauses and articles in the constitution which give special protections uh, to the states of the Northeast, uh, including my state. And I think that's in the end, how you keep a large democracy such as, such as ours, united and vibrant. Thank you. Thank you very much. Raghav, do you, uh... From, from your perspective, at this moment, it's February 2021, the farmers are still camped out around the city uh, that, that you are governing for, uh, in the state government. Um, is consensus building at this moment the responsibility of, uh, of your party as the national opposition? Is it, part, is it the responsibility of the government? 
And what do we do if, uh, if we keep moving further and further away from consensus? Look, of course, it is on any given day, the responsibility of uh, the government that holds majority in the lower house. And certainly uh, the responsibility of the government that holds uh, an extremely brutal majority in the lower house. And it is their responsibility to not just uh, indulge in an exercise of consensus building, but also uh, neither undermine opposition nor seem to be undermining opposition. I think these two are extremely critical. And what we saw uh, with the farm laws is that whether it was the Lok Sabha or the Rajya Sabha, the House of the Commons or the House of the Lords, uh, we saw that you know both uh, both uh, you know in both these houses the laws that were tabled did not go through a democratic process of debate, dialogue, and discussion. And it was, and as a result of that, what you see is that voices uh, from all sides were not heard. And now you have the farmers for whom allegedly these laws were made are protesting. Now, uh, I also feel that it is important to, uh, you know, recognize opposition to begin with. That is step one. Now, what you have in Lok Sabha, there is a convention and it's not a statutory rule that in order to give the position of leader of opposition, uh, that particular political party or that formation uh, needs to hold at least 10% of the total number of seats of the parliament. So if you do not have more than 54 seats in the Lok Sabha, you will not be recognized as a leader of opposition. Now, that may be a con convention but it could have surely been done away with and this government could have at least begin by acknowledging opposition, acknowledging the role of opposition and giving the opposition its, its due. Uh, but unfortunately, what we see is that the ruling party, that is the BJP, did not even give the role, uh, did not even give the office of the leader of opposition to you know, the largest uh, uh, opposition party in the parliament, that is the Congress party, whether it was the 2014 Lok Sabha elections or the 2019 general elections. Uh, uh, the, on the contrary, what you see in Delhi is that Arvind Kejriwal ji and the Aam Aadmi Party got a thumping verdict, perhaps the highest ever mandate given to any political party in India's uh, electoral history, much more than what Prime Minister Modi got in 14 and 19. Uh, we got, Aam Aadmi Party got 95% of the seats of the house in the year 2015, that is 67 out of 70. And it was very easy for us also to deny the Bharti Janta Party, the opposite, who uh, is the uh, opposition party in the Delhi Assembly, the role of the leader of opposition. But what the Aam Aadmi Party did, what Mr. Kejriwal did, is that he walked an extra mile, acknowledged the role of opposition and said that, hey, look, you may not have 10% of the total number of seats in the Delhi Assembly, but we'll still give you that position of leader of opposition because we recognize the role of opposition. We recognize the voice of opposition and we recognize how critical the function of a credible opposition is uh, to keep the government of the day in check and to uh, you know hold the government accountable uh, in, in, in uh, today's parliamentary democracy. And I think it is important that those who have power and certainly those who have brutal power to walk this extra mile and uh, at the same time, uh, Raghu, uh, I would also say that uh, while we are talking of the role of uh, uh, the government of the day and those who have the numbers in uh, the Lok Sabha, it is also important for the opposition to come up with a new narrative and a new alternative dream, uh, which I have already said. I think we don't, we don't necessarily need a new parliament building. What we need is a new credible opposition. Sorry. Yes, absolutely. I think that that really is a that is a point to to uh, to underline, and it's something that I think connects to the question of of how the opposition will act together. But first, I want to uh, ask Supriya ji. She has the most experience as a three-term um, MP, and has seen both uh, both the parliament functioning under the previous government, under the UPA, and under the under the Modi NDA. So I'm very curious to. To, to see what your perspective, your your answers have been quite diplomatic, Supriya ji, and I know that that is your uh, your reputation and it's what you bring to the table. But um, you must have seen things change, and it, you must have some concerns about that as well. 
you know actually i believe in complete um, freedom of speech so i really don't get that affected when people go even extreme stands even about us so but the unfortunate part is um, in india today is the way everything is connected to religion and identity politics and uh, we have all forgotten the agenda of development i mean i can't remember last time in parliament in the last 6 years where we had a data based discussion or a debate on pure hardcore subjects as say even education i mean even something as simple how can anybody disagree on education giving good quality education and then somebody will say oh you know there were aircrafts uh in the like in the 14th century and you know there was some elephant's head was i mean you know it's sort of the whole scientific india that we just build on on realistic targets so they will take everything away from what really the core issues are and i don't blame people in position of power today i blame us as the opposition today i so easy to blame somebody else says oh we can't be effective because of somebody how about we taking ownership of our actions and it's very easy to say that oh we don't have enough of a voice okay parliament may is not the only forum for us to fight what is right or wrong we need to get on to the field go to the ground convince people and take our issues forward which is in the larger interest of the nation i mean look at mahavikas aghadi we managed i mean nobody thought we'd even last 2 months 3 months 15 months 10 months we've managed and so far even these challenging covid times not because we are a part of the administration i think maharashtra government has been very honest very transparent everybody thinks it's one of the worst affected or managed managed states be a vis-a-vis covid but i think honestly if you look at the data and the way it's handled it i think the government has done a fairly good job and forget what you see from the outside all the surveys which are done by the same channels which are i am not as transparent as they used to be before they can't be as transparent because of the pressure from administration i mean press is not any more as open and honest or brazen as they used to be in the past so i think i would like to take the point of what uh, gorov said earlier is that we are i think we need to put the nation first and being an opponent means we are not against a party it is in the larger interest of the nation i think we've forgotten that thought and people are scared in this country whether you like it or not people are scared i have friends who tell me that forget it yeah we want to do business in this country we don't want to say anything forget it our newspaper has to run i am an editor if i go against i will lose my job as an editor so i think this is something which is very something very new to me in this so called new india so i think it's it's very difficult it's very painful but you can't give up yeah you have to fight it otherwise what's the point right yes i think you're right it it you know people are scared and i think that we can see that reflected even in the questions that people have uh, shared on this zoom they 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 kind of uh, expressing a, a lot more alarm and a lot more frankly panic than um which, which i think a, a lot of us can can understand so for instance som thomas says uh how will you you know issue by issue opposition is meaningless when the core of india is being restructured how will you prevent fascism by just being a business as usual opposition Uh, and then he says as in this discussion so i think he's suggesting that we are having some business as usual conversation here uh, which may be true then San- santosh gedam also says in the context of a non listening majority government what strategy is short and long term the opposition's have to keep them relevant in the changing democratic system and i think that this um, the the subtext there is what gorav already highlighted and what you just uh also highlighted in by bringing up the mahavikas agadi which is now sailing quite stably i believe into its second year which is um we're clearly looking at a situation in which uh in which the opposite in which opposition is in the position of being is it a risk of being routed unless it acts together and uh and in previous examples show how powerful opposition uh, parties can be when they act in in alliance 
and the MVA is such a good example of that. Uh, you have you maneuvered these parties that were otherwise very difficult to see as acting in a, an alliance into into an alliance which is now um, a very strong center of opposition to the BJP. So, uh, in the context of your states, but also since two of you are MPs, in the context of a national opposition, what do you see as the prospects of a real strong, organized, and um, and fair national opposition alliance or Mahagathbandhan? Uh, Supriyaji, why don't you start? See, a Mahagathbandhan is not difficult at all. Whether I mean, we may all have our differences, but I feel Congress is something which obviously has to lead it because they still have all their voters all over the country. You know, they, they, they're clearly um, there, their visibility, their workers, and there is a voter today, whether even people in power believe or not, there is a Congress voter and people are. I mean, there are people who walk up to me at odd places, be it a station, be it in, you know, in a college if you go to or at the airport and say, we are looking for an alternative. Give us a strong alternative. I mean, people actually sometimes are upset with us because they think we are not giving them a strong opponent. So people want an alternative and maybe we also have to introspect as an opposition and see that where are we lacking? It's no point only blaming somebody else becoming more powerful all the time because I don't believe that there is no space for us. There is. I mean, Gaurav and me did. I mean, what surprised me about even my election, I took my earlier uh, 2014 election far more confidently than 2019. I was far more casual, I would say, in 2014 and said, no, no, I, I think I've performed well. I've done well in parliament and I think my... Uh, social sector numbers in my constituency are well and I think um, you know I should do okay and I didn't do as well as I did but in 2019 I did a structured campaign you know Mr. Amit Shah came three times to my constituency the then chief minister came to every block of mine he took six meetings there was not a central minister who did not come the prime minister came in out of three constituencies. So you also have to be that I'm going to fight. Even if I go down, I'm going to go fight. And we went all out and actually my vote share went up. And the more they cornered me, the more it went in our favor. Even Mahavikas Agadi, how much were they giving Congress and NCP? Gaurav will remember the surveys were giving us 20 seats between Congress and NCP. And we've crossed 100 together. So the more they corner you, you have to, I mean, you can't let somebody bully you. The minute people feel that you are getting bullied and you are not putting up a fight, then people say, if they are not going to fight for us, even people give in, yeah, people are watching us. We are underestimating the Indian citizen or the Indian voter. He is or she are extremely smart. So I think what we have done in the past is we've also not fought it in the way what people are looking. People want assurance that you will deliver superior results to them. There was a dream Mr. Modi showed them. And which maybe, I mean, I don't want to get into Mr. Modi versus our uh, BJP versus us. It's the, what they wanted to do. They, they had a charter plan. Yeah. We need to get our house in order. We need to put our ideas, implement them like we are trying to do in, uh, in Maharashtra. And you see state after state, you will see how they, I mean, I'm convinced, however far they go in West Bengal, I'm dead sure that Mamta Banerjee will win this, come, this election. This is just, I just get so that. Ji, let me, let me just ask you in, uh, I, I don't want to say in one word, yes or no, but, um, but maybe you can consider it that way. For the next national election, do you think that, uh, that the three parties represented here should all be acting in concert uh, and, or, you know, and it should be part of a, of a proper seat sharing alliance, if not more. I mean, I've, we've seen we've seen parties take stronger measures. In 1977, parties across the political spectrum actually merged, not just into an alliance, but into a single party. And that's what it took to defeat uh, the, the Indira Gandhi government, which did come out of the emergency, still quite popular. So there are strong measures. And I do agree with you that Indian uh, citizens are waiting for the opposition to offer something really strong and really dramatic and not just uh, to keep um, 
passing the buck to each other. Do you think that something like that is required for 2024? Uh, uh, my point is why required? I mean, I think even we realize we need it. It's not just a requirement. It's not just about the opposition. You know, it's not the whole thing about politics is not even only being in power. It's about doing the right thing. I mean, what, why? See, we all need to introspect and think, why are we in politics? And second is, what is our role? Our role is not only becoming a mantri and, you know, you know, if you want to give good administration, you want to give people a voice, I think we all need to have clarity about our roles and our vision, which I think sometimes we lack. And you notice state after state, you will see BJP is not doing that well in states. It's only when... And, in, and let me tell you, Mahavikas Agadi, we just... So really sorry, I might... I might have to ask you to wind up so that I can get in the other two just before yeah, we end. Let me just give you the last line. Yes, for Lok Sabha, we will want to all three fight together in Maharashtra. Thank you. That's a, that's a good statement to take forward. Um, Raghav, would you like to jump in and share your thoughts on that? As briefly Look, as possible, uh, if you don't mind. Very briefly, I'll try to finish this in one sentence, which is that I do not believe uh, that we uh, require only a Mahagathbandhan or some sort of formation based on pure arithmetic. What we need is a new dream, an alternative vision. And I think that is what is lacking. Uh, if you were to look at the last Uttar Pradesh elections, uh, theoretically, purely on paper, uh, from an arithmetic standpoint, the BSP-SP alliance was something an alliance that could not have been defeated by the BJP. Uh, if, if alliances are formed purely on the basis of arithmetic, uh, then it was a perfect alliance. However, they lost and they lost badly. Why did that happen? That happened because they couldn't articulate an alternative view, an alternative vision, an alternative dream. And the people of Uttar Pradesh rejected that. Now, what I am alluding to is that this, the, the, our opposition, whether it's the political opposition, or uh, non-political actors, ne they need to come out with an alternative vision, an alternative dream, which is better, superior, uh, and more beneficial to the people than the dream that Prime Minister Modi uh, is uh, showcasing, of course. Okay, thank you. That's, I think that's a, that's a good point, and it's a good thing to, to hand over to Gaurav. Uh, I'll give you the closing remark, uh, and it's appropriate for that to go to a congressman and a member of, um, of still the largest party in the country in the opposition. Um, thank you, Raghu. Um, I think, I, let me just remind, uh, let me start off by saying that, you know, politics and democracy is a, a clash of ideas. Uh, and, and, and what we pursue uh, as ideas of what a strong, united India looks like. And while politics uh, was far more civil in the earlier years, it has become that much more aggressive and passionate in, in, in times today. Um, and therefore, it's very necessary that we don't get lost in the fight, but take a step back, as Supriya said, and think about the larger vision of what it means to be India, what it means to be Indian, and what, where does India's future lie in, and what, what is the role that India needs to take in order to be a global leader, in order to be an Asian leader, in order to be better than who we are. And that's where I feel that, you know, both as supporters of political parties and as actors in the political space, we need to reflect on that. And we might need to reorient ourselves as well. We have to go beyond our traditional role as political actors and political parties and political supporters as well. To take in point, even in the current recently concluded US election, you saw many Republican Party supporters and members voting for a democratic government because they felt that for the sake of the American dream, this election was more important about the American dream rather than the political support. And that's where I think my reach out to both political parties and to political supporters is that we need to you know, think beyond our just leanings and think about the larger Indian story and the Indian road uh, roadmap. Uh, and my, when we have to reorient ourselves and the MVA is a classic case, is a very good example of Shiv Sena, of the Congress party, of the national the NCP coming together for the largest sake of the people of Maharashtra. Even in Assam, as we're heading to elections, the way the Citizenship Amendment Act 
united the various political actors and the people. We've seen parties which were traditionally opposed to each other, which is the Congress and the regional party of AIUDF, coming together as a broad anti-CAA uh, coalition. Uh, and I think that's where, um, you know, where we have to think about uh, in the future as well, that we have to take greater risks uh, we cannot be of, you know, you know, this is a, a new era of politics is a new era of power of the of the of, and we have to, you know, take a step beyond and we have to play as per the nature of the world we live in, which is far more assertive, far more youthful, far more participative through social media. So we have to play through this in this in this, within this new era and with the new norms. And we have to be far yes. more aggressive. And as, as Supriya said, we have to be far more uh, active. And I don't say that, you know, for the next election, I will not, you know, uh, comment on whether we need uh, a coalition or not. But I think we need a, more, a commitment um, and a recognition to what we feel is good for our country and good for our country. And if we understand that, if we have clarity on that idea, if we are committed to that idea, then we should do what is necessary and be and take risks and be yeah. creative. Yes, thank you. I think that you that you you used a powerful phrase there, a new era of power. And it's clear that everyone in the comments and uh, most Indians that uh, I speak to are waiting for a new era of uh, of opposition alliance to meet it. Um, and we'll be watching the three of you certainly very closely to see how you lead us towards that. Uh, thank you all very much. I'm going to hand it back to Akshay Marathe and, and um, enjoy the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dagu. Thank you so much, Mr. Gugoy, Ms. Sule, and uh, Mr. Chadda for joining us. It's a Sunday early morning. I understand it was a bit difficult for uh, everybody to kind of uh, start the day like this. And especially Mr. Gugoy, I know you're in the middle of a, a grueling election campaign and we wish you all the best for the upcoming elections. We, I think something was represented in the comments also is that you rarely see a, a group of politicians speak so civilly, so decently with each other and, and you know, lay out their uh, uh, strategy for a, for a better India. And I think it was very, uh, I think it, we left uh, people on a very optimistic note. Uh, there is some hope. I think there is concern, but there is also some, some uh, 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 glimmer of hope that this discussion kind of introduced. And I would, uh, once again, thank you all so much for your time. Thank you for all our viewers watching from across the world. We had people from India, the US, Europe streaming in. But I must uh, uh, also say that this is not the end of the India conference. This is only the second day of the India conference. We have an exciting uh, lineup of sessions coming up. I want to quickly take a moment and show what we have coming up for you. I did not Right after this session, we have uh, a panel on India-China border conflicts. We have the former foreign secretary and the ambassador uh, to China, Ms. Nirupama Menon Rao, Harshvi Pant, and C. Udaib Bhaskar discussing uh, what, what holds for the India-China relationship. And we also have something to do with the future of work in India, especially in the post-COVID world. How is, the, how is work going to change? How is that going to shift? Uh, we're going to start in exactly 10 minutes more. You can go to india-conference.com and hit join session against any of these two uh, uh, sessions and enter them and watch our speakers speak about it. Thank you again and see you in 10 minutes.